Um, hi, everybody. And uh, so I'm going to be talking to you today about a landscape analysis, trying to give an overview of what is currently taking place in HIV cure research. Uh, and these slides will be made available also, I'm told. So uh, you can have them. So I'll be talking about a survey that uh, was undertaken by TAG uh, and giving you some characteristics of uh, current HIV cure trials and then talking in a little more detail about some of the survey responses. So the purpose of this analysis, this landscape analysis, um, we received a request from Mike McCune at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to uh, take a look at the current research, see what's going on, see um, what kind of strategies are under consideration, uh, how many trials under each of the different categories, thinking about when we can expect to see results, thinking about where studies are taking place around the world, uh, is there a good geographic diversity, what are the participant demographics, so who is being enrolled in these studies, and then thinking about future direction, so where the field looks like it might be moving based on current research. Um, and so, you know, I want to certainly extend a thank you to Mike for uh, making this request so that we could do this study. Uh, so TAG maintains a listing of current HIV cure related trials and big thanks to Richard Jeffries for keeping that current. Uh, That is a, a massive undertaking. Um, and so that is where the bulk of these surveys, or that is where all of the surveys uh, came from. So just as a note, phase one trials don't have to enter their information into clinicaltrials.gov, but many of them do voluntarily. Um, and so studies come from clinicaltrials.gov and from other sort of national registries of, of studies. The ways that cure related is defined for the purposes of the TAG listing and this analysis. Uh, if there are measures of the HIV reservoir, measures of virus persistence, evaluations of immune response, um, or if there's an ATI, an analytic treatment interruption. So that's how cure is being defined. Um, so a study might not be just about HIV cure, but may have a cure related endpoint. <coughs> Out of the 128 studies that are in TAG's listing when we did this analysis at the end of last year, 113 of those are phase one or phase two. So that's important for a few reasons. Uh, mostly because phase one, uh, so the NIH Revitalization Act that requires participant diversity applies to phase three studies, as well as some pivotal phase two and phase four studies, but does not apply to uh, phase one studies or many phase two studies, right? So most of the studies taking place in HIV cure are small. They are uh, enrolling a small number of participants and they're very early stage. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. Here's a screenshot of uh, the tag listing if you're interested in more. Uh, the link is available uh, on the slides and so you can see uh, TAG's website keeps a list of all of the current HIV cure trials and so that's where the bulk of this information came from. That's where all this information came from, excuse me. So out of the 128 trials in TAG's report at the end of last year, uh, we sent surveys to everybody in, I'm going to make this bigger so I can see on here. We sent surveys to all of the contacts who are listed for the study. Um, and if someone responded, a few people were out on uh, maternity leave, and so someone else in their office said, oh, try this person, right? So we sort of collected contacts for all of the studies in the database. 72 people completed the survey. So it was mostly principal investigators or study, uh, sort of, uh, study chairs, study co-chairs, um, or somebody acting on behalf of the principal investigator. Seven people declined to, particip declined to complete the survey, so um, just weren't interested in participation. Uh, and then some people just did not respond at all. Um, so we had survey information from 72 folks and then also went through the clinicaltrials.gov listings to look where study procedures were listed and to find estimated study completion dates. So 
uh, if you've ever spent time perusing the clinicaltrials.gov study listings, you may know uh, they range in uh, the amount of information they provide. So some studies did provide an extensive list of all the procedures they were uh, planning to do, and other studies provided much less information. Uh, so that is reflected in this data that uh, there might be more procedures that were not uh, sort of available through that listing. So TAGS uh, listing separates studies out into a number of different categories. And you can see here on this slide the different um, trial categories who did respond. So somebody from a study under each of these categories did respond to the study or to the survey. Um, so there's a, out of 24 different categories, uh, there are you know, a, a large variety of the different categories represented here. So um, ranging from observational studies, therapeutic vaccines, hormones, treatment intensification, uh, really a wide range of studies are under consideration, right, wide range of strategies. And we did get representation from most of those strategies in this survey. So we were asking people to tell us about their studies, basically, uh, and many of the categories are represented here. This chart, I recognize that the font is very small, but you can see the picture. This is a geographic spread. Does anybody care to guess what that might be? That's USA, right? So um, 30 studies uh, are taking place in the USA. Many studies are taking place in multiple countries, so a study might be represented here more than once. Uh, but just to give you a sense, the bulk of CURE research at this time is happening in the US but there is also a spread um, really globally. So Argentina, Australia, Botswana, Brazil, Canada, China, Denmark, France, Germany, Haiti, India, Italy, Kenya, Malawi, Netherlands, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Tanzania, Thailand, Uganda, UK, Zimbabwe, and US, right? So really a global spread here, but um, many studies are taking place in the US. And these are the people who did respond to our studies. So thinking about the big picture, an overview of all the studies that are taking place in TAG's listing, uh, this is where all of the studies are. You might notice this picture looks very similar to the other picture, indicating that we got responses from people that seem pretty representative of all of the studies. Um, looking across the number of participants in all trials, what uh, seems important to note here is this range that I've put a pink box around. So many of the studies, because they are phase one and phase two, are enrolling very small numbers of participants. Uh, so some studies are enrolling anywhere between three and 18, 10 to 20 participants. Um, but this second column here is the average number of participants. So you can see really small average numbers of participants. These are not, for the most part, large studies. They're, they're going to be um, much smaller. So I've separated it out here uh, by category. Um, so thinking about, again, this range, right? So many of the studies are very small, very early phase studies. And uh, that's going to have some implications as far as thinking about who is represented in these studies. Uh, something that we in the community are often interested in is the invasive procedures required in our participation. Um, and so I have pulled out here total number of invasive procedures. Uh, this again is coming from the clinicaltrials.gov listings as well as supplemental information that survey respondents provided. So this could be, it's very likely this is an under-representation. Um, the first column is uh, ATI, so treatment interruption. Second column, looking at lumbar punctures. The third column, high volume blood draws or leukapheresis. Fourth column, uh, biopsies, gut, so gut biopsies, and then lymph node biopsies in the last column. Uh, so there's a large, a large ask of participants, right? So at least 32 studies are asking for an ATI. Uh, at least 10 are asking for lumbar punctures. At least 21 asking for high volume blood draw. At least 17 are doing gut biopsies and at least eight are doing lymph node biopsies. Uh, often a study will be doing many or all of these procedures, right? So that's really a, a lot being asked from participants. This is, um, as I said, including all of the studies in the in the tag listing, so not just the survey respondents. Um, 
and again, thinking about when results are coming. So because these are early studies, many of them are optimistic that we are going to have results soon. So 38 trials are expecting to have results this year in 2019, and another 29 are expecting results in 2020. Um, so these early studies are likely to be wrapping up soon and will then inform the next studies that are, are developed. Uh, just, you know, if you are interested in a particular category, when you do have the slides, you can pull that out here. Um, but so you can see really this yellow bar is 2019. Uh, so a large, the majority of studies are going to be concluding this year and next year. Uh, the ones that are outliers here are the gene therapy studies. So those often have really long follow-up periods, and so those are um, outliers to 2034. Um, but the, the majority, it's a, it's a pretty narrow window this next couple of years. So this next section uh, is about the characteristics of participants in the studies. And I have a strongly worded disclaimer. Um, so the demographic information is incomplete, right? We were surveying study teams, the PIs, about studies that are enrolling currently. Some of the studies have not yet opened or barely just opened. Some are further along in development. Um, so this information is provided to date when the respondents were willing to provide it, right? So one, is incomplete. Two, it's early data, so it could change, um, right? And so trends that are appearing should be interpreted cautiously, but I think we can still see a picture that can make us think, um, right? And so, uh, at this time, there, is, there was not sufficient data to conduct, conduct analysis on racial and ethnic diversity in non-US or multinational studies. Um, because the data came primarily from survey responses, there were also three publications from completed studies that I supplemented the survey responses with, but mostly this is people telling us, right? So um, surveys taking place in other uh, non-US sites or multinational sites did not provide enough information for me to kind of say anything meaningful. But we do know in US only studies, enrollment to date is 39% black or African American, 52% white or Caucasian, 16% Hispanic. There's not, there's just not enough, there was 34 studies that I had this information for, so there just wasn't enough information to kind of look for correlations and trends, but we are gonna be doing a follow-up analysis later this year, um, and I hope to be able to entice more information at that time. Um, there was enough information to look for some trends uh, on sex of participants. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, many of the categories are 100% male participants at this time. Um, based on survey responses, again, and published studies. So this does include studies that are still open. It might only be 50% enrolled. Um, and also, these are very small ends. Just a note on my methods. Um, when somebody responded to the survey that a participant uh, demographics were mostly male, I entered that uh, at a generous 51%. Um, so these numbers, you know, I don't know, it's mostly 51 or 90. So these numbers uh, may be more skewed than this uh, perhaps initially appears, right? But so you can see um, a number of categories are 100% male. Um, additionally, Forgive me. I'm, oh, yes, Michael. No, just real quick. Um, is that all trials, like whether they're completed or close to the moment and all that? So this is everyone who responded to a survey. So it is a range, yeah. So some of these studies are just started enrolling. Some are doing you know, sort of analysis at this point. Um, Forgive me, I'm not an artist, but I tried here. So you can see that across the top, we had 128 studies in the listing. I was able to find sex information for 44 of those studies, which is here. One study uh, enrolled 100% female participants. 18 studies enrolled 100% male participants. 25 studies enrolled male and female participants. Of the 18 studies that enrolled 100% male participants, two of them had a sex-based exclusion criteria, so you had to be a male to enroll. The other 16 had no sex-based exclusion criteria, so certainly could have enrolled female participants or could start enrolling female participants, but thus far they have not. Uh, yes, Jeff? What about the uh, one study that was all women? Was that four women? Or? 
Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there was sex-based inclusion criteria there okay. as well. Um, so the, the 25 studies that enrolled male and female participants, the mean female enrollment in those studies is 28%. Um, because this includes studies of infants and newborns, if you remove the brand new humans from the analysis um, and look only at studies that enroll adolescents and adults, that percentage drops to 16. Um, so this seems clear to be an area that we could uh, do a bit better. But again, interpret cautiously, this is still, like some, you know, many of these studies are still open. So hopefully when we do the follow-up analysis next year, we have a different picture. Um, thinking about study development, kind of how studies are being uh, developed, 38 survey respondents specified that community representatives or community advisory boards had been involved in study development. Right, so that's um, just about half of the respondents. 22 of those 38 people indicated that the community was really supportive or enthusiastic about the comment. So they would write that in as the additional information. Community was so encouraging, community was very supportive. The most common community concerns were related to treatment interruptions and drug resistance. So this is uh, the information that uh, PIs provided again. Thinking about obstacles during development, so the little piece of pizza at the top is uh, community concerns over study. The bigger piece of pizza that's pulled out is team concerns. So based on, again, PI's perceptions, they are more concerned about uh, intensity of participation than community members are. So does that make sense, right? So 16 PIs were like, we're really concerned about the intensity of participation, and only seven PIs thought that community was concerned um, over participation. Did I explain that? I think I did. Okay, so then let's see what happens when studies are actually open. Uh, so to get at the question about what these studies look like, uh, this is just which studies are less than 25% enrolled, 25 to 49, 50 to 74, and greater than 75% enrolled. Um, so most studies are either just opening or wrapping up with kind of a dip in the middle. But again, they do expect to be concluded within the next year or two. Some general trends from the survey results, so what uh, PIs did respond. Most studies are having about 20 months, so slightly longer than a year and a half, to uh, fully enroll. Most participants are going to be enrolled in treatment intensification, observational, and combinations. So combination studies, studies that are classified as combinations, are simply uh, taking more than one category of approach, right? So um, that's what combinations means. It should be noted of those 1,403 participants in treatment intensification studies, 905 of those participants are pregnant women who are being enrolled in a trial of HIV treatment in newborns. So it is, uh, there will be 905 newborns. It is suspected that only about five to 10% of those newborns will be HIV positive. So only about five to 10% of the newborns will sort of follow through in the study, the rest uh, will receive standard HIV preventative care um, and then exit the study. So that number looks perhaps bigger than might you know, actually be. The most common obstacles that were encountered, reported being encountered during enrollment are that participants are hesitant to undergo <laughs> study procedures um, with an N of 21, uh, nine, Respondents indicated there were no obstacles during enrollment, and 15 respondents indicated that you know, there not being a benefit for participation seemed to be an obstacle. So thinking about um, sort of the perception of obstacles in development and then actual obstacles during enrollment. Yeah. Benefits meaning health benefits? Yeah, yeah. So no, compensation. Right, so no uh, benefit to participants. Um, questions, please? <laughs> Oh, the question was um, benefits as in health benefits, not financial benefits. And yes, this means no benefits as in no benefit to the participant, not incentives. Yeah. Do you have any information on the incentives? Uh, I will hang tight, hang tight. Okay. I, 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 will I will say that I don't have information on incentives, but plan to okay. look into that in the follow-up. 
So um, again, pulling out the obstacles to enrollment, that piece of pizza that is pulled out is that participants are hesitant to undergo study procedures, right? And so thinking about this in relation to the earlier graphic showing that during development, many study teams and PIs are thinking that um, they've sort of addressed all of these concerns, but the intensity of participation does seem to remain uh, an obstacle. Uh, Again, apologies for the graphic design here, but <laughs> I'm really not an artist. Uh, so this uh, indicates current enrollment by categories. This uh, may be interesting to you to look at later. Um, so pulling out kind of what the different categories of studies, how far along they are. So this color is observational studies. And this is actually quite legible on the, on the slides, which you will have access to, although perhaps not legible here. Uh, so observational is that sort of lime green color. The light blue that's at the bottom of the, um, here is treatment intensification, early treatment studies, um, just so that you can kind of get a sense for, if you're interested in a particular cat category, how far along they are. Uh, it's difficult to visualize this. Oh, thanks, Michael. Thank you. Treatment intensification, therapeutic vaccines, observational combinations. So uh, those are the sort of the bigger categories. Regulatory obstacles are perceived as a barrier by study teams, so a lot of uh, respondents indicated that the IRB was you know, really sort of reluctant to approve the study. Um, strict exclusion and inclusion criteria, slow enrollment. Um, and the most commonly cited obstacle, though, really is this participant hesitation around study procedures. As uh, I think many of us know, uh, ATIs can be scary and can deter participation, um, and other invasive procedures can also be scary and deter participation. Uh, so this is really seems to be a clear area where education, uh, both for regulatory bodies as well as for providers who might be referring potential participants and uh, community about these different procedures. Yes. Were these responses pre-populated, or did the investigators have the opportunity to actually list what they perceived to be various general? So uh, there was pre-populated responses and an other. Uh, so regulatory obstacles was pre-populated. Uh, uh, participant hesitation. Yeah, so there was pre-population and then uh, other please specify. Thank you. Um, so to think about what this means, what we might do with this information, um, as far as this specific information, uh, we're going to, Richard and I will share the write-up on TAG's website. We're seeking publication for this. We're happy to share it on social media. These slides will be available. And then we are planning a follow-up with people who responded to the first survey uh, towards the end of this year. Um, and in that follow-up, to get to Jeff's question, we're hoping to dig in more to um, participant characteristics. So thinking about uh, can we find, can we entice more information about participant demographics uh, to uh, look more into enrollment obstacles, the role of incentives, right? So there, there were some data that looked interesting that there might be some sort of, uh, there's some data that looks interesting that we want to kind of tease out this relationship between incentives and participation, kind of the ethics of that is something to think about as well. Um, and then also to see if there's any observable relationship between participant demographics and where trials are happening, what kind of trial it is, right? Remember all those categories that had 0% female enrollment, so is there sort of something uh, about those categories um, to see if there's a relationship between funders, so uh, is industry perhaps better or worse? So thinking about kind of funder, what does that matter? And then invasive procedures. Um, this is our, our plan moving forward, yes? Uh, I uh, one interesting thing would be access to healthcare outside of the entering the, the, the trial. Okay, because I think world, uh, around the world is completely different. Yeah. So, some people would have access anyway, or only if they are in a trial. Yeah, so thinking about access to healthcare generally, thank you, that's a, a great point. Um, and is the clinical trial site sort of your point of entry into healthcare or your access into? Yes. Um, you know, sort of health, health coverage in general, or is it uh, sort of optional, right? Yes? 
Could this be used for advocacy to help increase recruitment of women in HIV care related studies? Yes, so this absolutely could be used um, for advocacy to increase the recruitment of women into cure-related studies. Um, I, I think it's always helpful when doing advocacy to have data to back up your uh, advocating. So um, you know, this is, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Richard and I really want to make this available so that we can, uh, at a site level and kind of at a, a funding and regulatory level, do some advocacy. So, uh, you know, recommendations coming out of this are to continue engaging with community to proactively address participants' concerns about trials. Oh, is there a question? You know, what, one thing that might be interesting to look at in the future, the participant concerns around ATI, historically that was more around drug resistance and suppressing. Now there's a lot more concern around you and you implications of that. So mm -hmm. that might be interesting to tease out in the future about what those concerns are and maybe shift it. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was to look at um, concerns about ATI and how they may have shifted from drug resistance to what a treatment interruption means in U equals U uh, and the undetectable equals untransmittable era. Yeah, Jeff. Um, so age is often an exclusion. They won't, uh, it's just arbitrarily said 65 is the operator's limit. And in a lot of the more intensive trials, I'm having researchers say, you know, I had this cohort of older guys who are retired, have all the time in the world, they don't mind doing all these invasive procedures, they'd be ideal, they're perfectly healthy, but, you know, somebody 64 with the same parameters can get in, somebody 66 can't. So, you know, raising that issue and uh, raising it, making the exclusion criteria based on immunological parameters, not just our criteria. Yeah, absolutely. So raising the issue of age, thinking about upper limit of um, uh, participation, and uh, is it an arbitrary cutoff, or is it based on immunological uh, data? Yes. So I, earlier on in your presentation, I think my question was really around who actually spoke on community responses. Right, so where you had PI saying, this is what the community thought, and this is where community thought the challenges were. I think when we kind of asked the question about community participation in setting up and looking at the protocols or what the challenges were with study design, we got a, a bit of a different response from PIs in setting up challenges and barriers to participation of community voice in structure. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to say that all PIs are seeing study design equally. So I, you know, I think that there's a, there's room here for more advocacy with, uh, particularly around HIV cure research with community engagement. I, I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say. I, 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 I just don't think it's always equal with PIs in pure science here. Yeah, and so um, that's a great point, and. Uh, there was a checkbox, like was community involved, and then a space for comments, and in the comments that were uh, more extensive, so indicating, it, it seems like there might be a relationship between what we might describe as meaningful community engagement in study design and kind of better enrollment and better participant diversity as opposed to uh, community didn't veto the study kind of engagement, right? So, so yeah, that's absolutely thinking about how to kind of uh, make these partnerships better so that we can improve not just the research, but you know, make it better from the beginning. Um, oh, yes. Yes, uh, I also noted that that will uh, fall up on us because uh, you will say that um, the 80 percent, one the 80 percent of the respondents from the advisory boards involved. So, the 80 percent, that is less than half. So, I have uh, about 62 percent of the participants, participants not in the room and from the advisory board. So as a serious concern for what uh, Rassi said, we, we need to up that, and that's why I'm not, not engaging the commission effectively. Yeah, so 38 of the 72 uh, reported community engagement, so it's just about half, I think like 50, 54%, but that is nowhere close to 100%. Um, so so thinking about how we can sort of make that, that number better, right? And part of it is about increasing PI's buy-in in the community expertise, right? And recognizing that, you know, sort of PI's need to recognize um, community's experience and then also giving uh, multiple communities access to the research process to be able to kind of contribute. Yes. So, so, I mean, I think the follow-up on it, so I think maybe it's like to, to stagger it, right? So is it 
protocol review? Is it community engagement? Is it study design? Is it budget design? Is it budget voice? You know, what are the ways in which community has actually participated in this process rather than just saying, was community involved? Because if they say, oh, well, we, we showed it to the community, we said we were getting ready to do it. Yeah, no, thank you. That's excellent. So, and um, I'm really glad that we're doing the follow up analysis so that we can stagger it in that way to see, um, and similarly with incentives. So, right, uh, thinking about. Uh, how to now we know where we want to look, so that's a great suggestion. Um, another uh, recommendation is to think about if there's ways that we could do sex analyses across protocols, right? So if studies are enrolling only five participants, um, maybe we need to think about ways to kind of work across studies. Similarly, um, if there's a way to do gender analysis across protocol, um, if we're unlikely to get many more studies that are 100% female, you know, we're going to need to kind of do this work creatively. Um, a, another recommendation is for study teams to keep the clinicaltrials.gov entries up to date and comprehensive. So those are a free source of information uh, and the easier they are to sort of navigate and understand, the more useful that information is for communities. So this is a very simple recommendation. Um, Increasing education for referring providers and IRBs. So if providers are unwilling to refer their patients to be participants because they don't understand, I mean, this is complicated research that I don't understand, right? So, um, and I'm not like an MD. So um, thinking about how to kind of build provider buy-in to the research process outside of, uh, to, uh, to return to her question earlier about what is this uh, access to healthcare or research? Uh, thank you. And then finally, thinking about qualitative research with sites and studies that met demographic enrollment targets. So we did ask, do you have a demographic enrollment target? If so, how did you determine it? If so, are you going to meet it? Uh, so doing some qualitative research with the people who were able, also people who were not, but we might get more help from people who were able to meet those targets and see what worked for them. Um, so this is you know, sort of what we hope to do in this second phase. Um, I also really want to thank the organizers of this workshop for allowing me to present this um, and for you all for these good questions and suggestions. I put my email address here, but I can also uh, read that to you and Facebook. Uh, so it's bar, Liz Barr, B-A-R-R-L-I-Z-B-A-R-R -R -R at gmail.com. So if you want more information about any of this, I know it was a short time and kind of a high level. There's much you know, more detail on any number of these domains that I'm happy to talk about um, via email or during lunch. Um, but are there more questions now? I think I have a minute or two. Jeff? Quick question. So um, didn't they recently require that informed consent should be posted on um, clinicaltrials.gov? Does anybody else remember seeing that? I do not know the answer to that question, but I believe Jeff might know the answer to that question. Yeah, so under the new rule that takes effect this year, one consent has to be posted. So if there's a multi center trial and each side has different consents, only one of them has to be posted. But if it's a single site study, right. then the consent will be posted. So that, that will be available going forward, starting with the new rule. Yeah, thank you. But I think that's only the requirement is only after the study is finished. Uh, right. Well, it's unfortunate. Even though it's a great news, it's going to be public. It's only after the study is finished. Huh. Why is that? Yeah. I don't know. It was disappointing. I thought it was fantastic when, when I saw yeah. the post. Yeah. And now I've read the details of this. Uh, it, but it's not the story after the site is finished. Yes. Hey, Liz, thanks for the presentation. I was thinking about your recommendations and a hybrid between um, community engagement, which we've been talking about, and the idea of educating providers in IRG, which is really that topic of the sort of community and, and scientific literacy around peer research. Is I think what we struggle with a lot in our community. Um, I think the fears somewhat stem from that, right? And I, I wondered if there's any way you think you can gauge efforts around that or try to, I mean, to sort of advocate that there be budgets toward that sort of thing? Um, what do you think in terms of the future question? Yeah, so the question was about uh, community literacy and also scientific literacy. I think both directions, right, from community of the science and also scientific scientist literacy of community concerns, right? Um, so I absolutely think there should be budgets about that, but I think the ways that the budgets are spent, to get at some of the questions coming up over here, need to be determined by community, right? So it's not uh, just a site saying, all right, we've got 
$1,000, we're gonna have a dinner, right? But thinking about what might be a better use of those resources and those, time, uh, those times. I also, I was speaking with someone yesterday who suggested um, getting into the medical schools, right? So she was saying, I'm a second year med student and I don't know anything about like this stuff, but I, we don't hear about it ever in med school, and it would be so great to, you know, think about things during during our training. So that might be another area, kind of, of younger, eager folks who are like wanting to do better research. Uh, but yeah, so I think there ought to be specific budgets for um, not only increasing literacy, but also for enrolling diverse participants. Right. So you need to say we have a line item for enrolling our targets, whatever our targets are, right? And perhaps the targets are set site by site. Um, not every site will be able to enroll the same population, but a site should set a target and then say how they're gonna spend the money to meet that target, is my personal opinion. I don't know if that's the um, <laughs> authorized opinion. Yeah. If anyone else included in this research, but that's my, my perspective. One more question. I have time for one more question. <laughs> Okay, well thank you again so much. Uh, this was really great to be able to talk this through with you all.